Hey, good morning again. And yes, turn your eyes on Jesus. This has been the theme for our year. When we started 2020, we said, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. And with all that's happening, he's the one who is faithful. He's the one who continues to give us strength and hope as we walk through these challenging days. I've got two big announcements before we dive into the sermon. The first one is next week. We're going to be coming to you from a singular platform from all of our venues, from the sanctuary, from the Great Hall, from In Espanol. And uh, you'll find it there. You can see it on our website. In fact, go to our website. It's better. It's going to be better than YouTube, better than any of our other platforms, better than Facebook. You can invite all your friends to come and you'll have opportunity to engage and interact right there and choose options uh, as to where, how you want to worship the Lord next Sunday and henceforth and forever. The second announcement is July 19th. That's the day that our task force, our restart teams have said, hey, looks like we're going to be able to come together and, and worship the Lord together in person again, as it's meant to be. So target that day, mark it July 19th, invite friends to come. You'll see details about all that's going to happen, how we're going to be safe and all the, the different uh, you know, ways that we want to help you and your family worship the Lord. So let's do this now. Let's dive into the scripture. You, you can grab your Bible, do that. Uh, turn to the, the book of Daniel. You, uh, while you're finding it there, we'll get there in a moment. I want to set this up a bit. But, uh, you know, last uh, week we started our summer series in the book of Daniel, where we see that this young man, a teenager, along with his friends, is pulled out. You talk about the most radical new normal that anyone could ever experience. Daniel ends up uh, in a place far from home. He ends up in exile. And he, he's in a culture and a system that sought to reprogram him, to reassign him with a new identity, even new names, and force him to comprehensively conform to their way of life. Now, as we compare Daniel's sudden shift in his life to our own in this current kind of cultural moment we find ourselves in, we said this, one thing is certain in the new normal, uncertainty. So we're challenged then to say, how can we live in a world that flips upside down in a moment where everything changes? How can we continue to be faithful to the Lord? And even better than that, to live with great confidence and courage and and to be a faithful presence wherever he places us. This is the story of Daniel. We said that change and loss that brings about grief doesn't so much change us as it reveals us. It shows us uh, what our idols truly are. And we see this even in our day right now. All the things that we've experienced. But the key to walking into this new normal is what we see in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. It's a key verse that says, Daniel resolved in his heart not to defile himself. So we see from the very start of this story, a teenager determined, I will serve the Lord. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to follow him. I will not be defiled. And then this sets the tone for his entire life. Listen, as we step into the new normal, you and I've got to decide as exiles living in this world that we're not going to be defined by the patterns and be conformed to the stuff of this world. We've been talking about this for months, but the key to this kind of life, how about this? The key to a focused life is, well, focus. And what I'm seeing in our world today are not so much Christians that are just spinning out with horrific or dramatic sins, though that happens, What I'm seeing are good people, if you will, Christian people who are just distracted and not focused on what matters the most. What we see in Daniel's life is a man who was focused. He was a faithful presence for God because he knew that God was faithful. The key to his life was that he was a focused man who worshiped God through whatever came his way. And this is what we're learning in these days. You see, I'm seeing a lot of Christians who are allowing really the narrative of the kingdom of God that we find ourselves in being hijacked, being being derailed by opinions and patterns of the news or people in this world. With Daniel, we saw a white hot focus and he's and he's challenging us to live this way, especially in this uber polarized culture we find ourselves in today. It was theologian Karl Barth who said, 
you do this. You take the newspaper in his day. The, you take the newspaper in one hand, you take the Bible in the other, and, and you read the newspaper from the interpretation of the Bible. And what I'm seeing in our day is we got the news feed in one hand, and our other hand is empty. We're looking at the news. We're watching everything that's coming at us, and so much is coming at us. And we're not interpreting it through the Word of God and the truth of who God is. And so we're leaving the Bible out all together. I believe, friends, and, and we're going to get to Daniel here, but I'm setting all this up. I believe that we are in, in, at a turning point in our nation. And, and I, really, I really mean as the people of God. And, and if we're to move into this new cultural moment as ambassadors of our King, we've got to decide ahead of time. We've got to resolve that we will never go back to the way things were. We have a moment of decision. Not to go back to our unfocused lives, busy, distracted, uh, no margin, running harder after more stuff, more pleasure. May we never again place our hope in the stock market. May we never again place our hope even in our own health our wisdom or our education. May we not go back to racism, go back to social injustice. Instead, let's determine, and I'm confident, I'm seeing a shift. We're going to be different as we move forward as God's people. And if not, we're going to squander the moment. But I'm hopeful. I'm seeing our church rise up in new ways. And is it? it is exciting. But how do you stay focused? I'm confident that we will. How does it happen? You know, Paul asked questions like this when he looked at the culture of, of, of Corinth in the first century. In, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 20 and 21, he says, where is the one who's wise? That's what everybody's wondering now. Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, uh, it, it, it pleased God through the folly of what, was, what we preach to save those who believe. Here's what he's saying there. The folly of what we preach is Christ and Him crucified. This is the folly. The folly is that God Almighty would become a man in the person of Jesus and that he would live among us and show us. You want to know if God exists? Here I am. You want to know what God is like? Watch me. He lives the perfect life on our behalf because we couldn't. And he becomes this perfect substitute for us on the cross. He dies on the cross, taking on himself our punishment, our shame. This is the folly that we preach. Foolishness to those who do not yet believe. But for those of us who are saved, this is the power of God. This is life itself. He dies on the cross. He's buried and he's raised again so that we might be raised again to live, not simply to be beamed out to heaven, but to live now a resurrected life, power over sin, even in our own lives. And so people are wondering, where do I find the truth with so much that's coming at me? You find it in Jesus. And in him, then we practice the way of Jesus, which is always to do justice, to love mercy, and, 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 and to walk humbly with God as he did. So this season has been one of the most challenging and weighty seasons that I've ever experienced in my ministry. Now, one of the fun uh, diversions that's helped me out along the way that I've enjoyed is The Last Dance. I don't know if you've watched this. It's the ESPN miniseries on, uh, on Michael Jordan and his last uh, last year with the Chicago Bulls, through the lens of that last season, they look at his career. Now, one of the commentators in one of the episodes, he said this, most people live in fear because they live in the past and project the past into the future. Michael's a mystic, he said. He was never anywhere else. His gift was not that he could run fast, not that he could jump high or that he could shoot a basketball. His gift was that he was completely present, and that was the separator. I love that. He was fully present in the moment. Think about that. For Jordan, it wasn't the last season. It wasn't the last game. It wasn't his last shot, made or miss. It was the moment that he found himself in. We've talked about this so much, that the key to life is focus. The beginning 
of worship is attention. The beginning of worship is focus. And Daniel, again, he lived his life this way. This was his superpower. Focus on the one who has all power. And it's yours as well. So as we focus our hearts on him, we focus our hearts on his word. You can live a life of faithfulness right where you are, whatever comes your way, whatever you're going through today. So look at Daniel chapter two. Here we go. Uh, verse one. And I want everybody to listen in. Kids, students, hang with me because this is a story. OK, I think it's going to be fun. It's a narrative story all the way through the second chapter of Daniel. All right, so here we go. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was in trouble, was troubled, and his sleep left him. Now, this story gets really kind of weird right away. I mean, let's admit it, through our modern lens. Um, but back in the day, back during this time, dreams were a way that they believed uh, that they could gain insight into not only current situations and, and events, but also future events. And so think about it, when you're in a godless culture, okay, this is a, an, an animistic, uh, you know, pluralistic, polytheistic culture. They don't know the one true God. So they're searching for anything they can grasp, right? They don't know the one true God. And it's such a time of instability that they're looking for something stable. And, and so uh, this was not so uncommon. It says here in, in Second. Uh, the second verse, then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans. Now, this sounds a little bit more like Harry Potter than it does the Bible, doesn't it? And the Chaldeans be summoned to, the, to tell the king his dreams. So they, they came in and stood before him. Now, this sounds, uh, sounds crazy to us again. But again, they don't worship the one true God. They're, they're, again, animist, which means they believe that spiritual forces somehow animate from, from the natural world. And so kings would pay large sums of money to groups of people, give them benefits and such, if they could interpret his dream. Daniel found himself with his friends among this group of counselors, okay? So, so not unlike our day, many leaders who are willing to pay whatever price it would take to help them be successful. In verse three, and the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will show you the interpretation. Now think about this. If the king, if the king doesn't, if they don't know the king's dream, then how can they interpret it, right? Or if the king doesn't understand his own dream, he tells them the dream and then they can just say, well, here's what it means. It means this. And he says, wow, it must mean that. So instead, watch this, he throws him a curve. What he does, he says, first tell me the dream itself, then tell me the interpretation. And, and look at what happens here. And he even says in verse five, or, or I'm gonna destroy your homes. We're gonna turn, what would have happened? They turn their property into government property. We're gonna get rid of you guys who aren't any help from me. We're gonna replace you with others on the council, on my council. The king's really angry. And by verse nine, he says, stop playing with me. Let's go. Verse 10, he says, the, Chal it says, the Chaldeans answer the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands. For, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magicians or enchanters or Chaldeans. See, what he's saying is, uh, this is not how it goes. You tell us the dream, then we interpret the dream. We consult, literally, with our books on dreams so that we know how to interpret. We can find, uh, there are artifacts on, on how they looked at these uh, dreams and, and how, they, how they interpreted them. They're saying this is beyond our ability, and it was beyond their ability. These Babylonians had no power to do this. Uh, this is not unlike people trying to tell us in our day what's happening in our world without looking through the lens of God's word. It's like our own lives personally. How can we interpret what's happening in our lives and in our world if we're not first looking through the lens of God's word? See, if you take God out of the equation, before you start asking the question, it always leads to craziness. So consider this, take God out of the equation, let's start asking the key questions of life. Questions of origin, where do we come from? Uh, let's, well, not God, there is no God. So we must have come from nothing. Because ultimately you get to the uncaused cause, right? 
We came from nothing. Scientifically impossible. You can't get something from nothing. You can't get non-living matter or living matter from non-living matter. And so we take God, it's like saying, uh, it's like saying there's no number four. What's two plus two? Um, no, there's no four. Three? Could be five, somewhere in between. You see, see, here's the thing. When you eliminate the answer before you start the equation, it always leads to absurdity. And this is what we find here. I've been in cultures like this where they don't know the one true God. They've never heard the gospel. And you see crazy stuff. And it's not generally atheism. It's worship of whatever comes our way. I think it was Nietzsche who said, there are more gods than there are realities. We make them up unless we come to the one true God. So listen, don't enter into this new normal. Don't enter into this afternoon. Don't enter into this week without the certainty of who God is and look at your world through the lens of his love and his truth in your life. Don't jump into your problems without him. Watch this. Don't jump into the past without God. It only leads to regret and shame. Don't jump into the future without God. It only leads to worry and anxiety. Again, this is Daniel's superpower. It's yours. Living in the present. Being faithful right where God has you one day at a time. So God is the answer before we start asking any questions of life. Look at what happens in verse 11. The thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. See, the false gods of Babylon or any religious system don't dwell with men, but Jesus did. You see, they're saying God is not that close to us. He doesn't dwell in the flesh. And yet, what does it say in John 1, 14? The word God became flesh and dwelt among us. And he still is among us even now by his spirit. This is what's so amazing about the incarnation. You see, is that God chooses to dwell among us. And most cultures, even here, think that is totally unthinkable. And yet that is the folly we preach, that God has become a man in the person of Jesus. But listen, these, these advisors have no power to reveal what the king had dreamt. And then in verse 12, it says this. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. He's like, I'm going to wipe you out. I'm going to fire everybody. No, I'm going to kill everybody. Because if you guys can't help me here, I'm not sure you can help me with any crisis that I might be facing. Verse 13, so the decree went out and the wise men were, uh, were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them because they were part of this group officially. And in verse 16, and Dan, look at this, Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. And so Daniel hears about this and he offers himself. Sometimes you just got to step in. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to make myself available. I'm going to bring the incarnate presence of God in my life to be a faithful presence right here. I don't know what's going to go down. I mean, I've had recent moments like this in these recent days. God wants me to step in. So God used me. This is what Daniel does. And he calls all of us to do this. But why, why does he do this? Because look, here it is. You are gifted for the glory of God. Daniel knew this. Our gifts are given by God to be used by God. This is the story of Daniel. Placed by God, gifted by God to bring glory to God. This is your life. This is why we exist. But Daniel's gifting, watch this, is not the ability to interpret dreams. You see, th that was a talent that came out of his gifting. His gifting was wisdom and discernment and faith. And I believe his gift was focus in the moment to be fully present wherever God put him. These were the gifts that we see in Daniel. Daniel knew he was gifted for God's glory, and so he steps in, but so are you. Sometimes you got to step in. Daniel went in, says in verse 16. But he did not go at this alone. Look at verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. 
I love this. The Babylonians' names are not mentioned. Now, this is probably, instead of the Hebrew names, if you might remember, it's not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are the Hebrew names. This may be a literary device to show the greatness of God. The fact that their identities were not stolen from them, that they had kept their identity. It's also a reminder that God's grace and his presence is with them. I love that. Daniel doesn't forget about what is arguably the greatest gift that God has given him. His companions, his friends. He doesn't forget them. It's a reminder for us in this time of separation. We need each other. And I'm so eager to be back with you in person, in the flesh. Daniel doesn't forget his friends and he brings them in to pray with him. And in verse 18, it says, and told them to seek mercy from God, the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now, don't miss this. They knew they only had one place where they could turn. They knew they had one that they could come to. This is critical because Daniel was clearly bright, capable, wise, full of brilliant gifts. But the temptation for many of us, and I think this is true for a lot of us, particularly in our church, people who are really gifted for us to rely totally on our gifts. See, one of the signs of spiritual maturity is to remember that all the gifts, all the abilities that we have are sourced in God. And him alone. And so we come back to him. And there's nothing that we can do apart from him. It's also a sign of spiritual maturity when you know that all of your gifting given by God, all that you might bring to the table is not enough. And you're in need of a miracle. And that's where some of us are today. This is where Daniel is. What did he do? He invited friends to come in. I need a miracle. Please pray with me because apart from God, this is not going to happen. This is key. Here we see Daniel's unique position caught between two worlds. This is what's going on. He's referred to here as one of the wise men of Babylon. Previously, he's referred to and then later he's referred to among the exiles of Judah. Daniel has his feet firmly planted in two worlds. This is what this entire series is about. Living in exile as citizens of another kingdom, which seems impossible to balance because of the, the, these two kingdoms are diametrically opposed. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world. Listen, friends, you and I are in, in, in Babylon. We're exiles in Babylon. But where the intersection takes place, where the engagement in culture takes place right there is where the kingdom of God shows up. So he's called us to enter in. Daniel's availability to step into that space allows God to move. And look at verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Look at this. God has given the king a dream. Now he gives Daniel a dream. I mean, this is God's providence throughout this whole story of Daniel's life. Daniel then, I love this. I'm going to take time here for a moment. He takes time to give praise to God. He pauses and stops. There's an incredible prayer right here, uh, right in the middle of chapter two. But I wanna ask you this. This was challenging for me this week. Do, Do you stop, do I stop and praise God when I see something great happen? Or do I just say, that's amazing. My life is is up and to the right now. That was a good thing. Or do we stop and say, Lord God, you did this. This is what Daniel does. Look at verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. See, the Babylonian gods could not, they couldn't offer any help here. God alone could do this. But even more powerful, look at this, verse 21. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Daniel doesn't parade around after doing something that nobody else could do. Instead, look at what he says. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. You see, his humility before the king in public begins here with his humility and gratitude before God in private. You see, our gifts will always lead us to pride and arrogance in public if we do not humble humble ourselves and to be grateful before God in private. Look at this in verse 22. 
He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what, it, what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. I circled that verse this week, verse 22. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him. That's a beautiful verse. Listen, it is only in God that we find wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and the ability to truly influence our world. We cannot do these things apart from Daniel lived in a time of temptation towards syncretism. That is, that is this, this combining of all kinds of thoughts, a pluralistic religious view, not far removed from where we are today. See, we're in danger of co-opting Christianity, co-opted with secularism, tribalism, nationalism, racism, materialism, you name the ism. Jesus plus anything leads to heresy theologically, and it leads to trouble and self-destruction in our own lives. What separated Daniel is what separates us, a white-hot focus on the one true God. You see, he's, he's able to, to reveal himself, and now we fix our eyes on Jesus. Look at verse 23. To you, O God, he's still praying, O God of my fathers, I give you thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. This is awesome. We need to remember here's what, that we are a faith of uh, a family faith as well. He's, he's praising the God of his fathers. He, he, he's realizing, you see, he's carrying on the faith in exile, in Babylon, is what we're going to see. He's carrying on, just as we carry on the gospel from one generation to another. How about this? We don't just carry it on to one generation to another. It, it's, it's through the blood of Jesus. It's the gospel that we carry on. It's why we teach our children about the love of Jesus through VBS. Why we raise up students, raising up the next generation. We pass the gospel on. You see, gifts are only gifts if we acknowledge the giver as the one who gives us those gifts. That's what Daniel's doing here. He's praising God. See, if we don't give credit to God, praise him for the gifts he's given, then, then those are no longer gifts. We're, we're actually not using them as gifts. We're stealing them. They go from gifts to being stolen goods. You see, if, if we don't praise God and give glory to him, for the gifts that he's given to us, then the gifts will terminate on us. If they don't come through us to bring glory to God, they'll terminate on us and we're done. We no longer bring glory to God, the very gifts that he's given us, our talents, our homes, our resources, our time, our money. You are gifted to bring glory to God. And look at this, secondly, you are gifted for the good of others. Look at verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, in, into Arioch, who the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. That's quite a job description. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show you the king. I will show the king the interpretation. So look what happens. The wise men of Babylon are spared. Uh, ultimately, this is where this is going to go. God is gracious. Watch this. Even to, to save those who propagate idolatry and practice evil. Now you say, well, that's not fair. No, this is the good news of the gospel. That he reaches out to people like you and me. That there is hope for us. There's hope for every person in your life. God reaches out and he says, I will rescue them as well. This is the good news of the gospel. We know what the problem is, friends. We, like Daniel, have discernment in this world. We know it clearer than Daniel. We know that we're in need of Jesus. We know the problem that our world faces and the gospel is the answer. We're gifted by God to glorify him. We're gifted for the good of others. Look at verse 25. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. Now listen to this. The world should be just as surprised as Arioch is that he would find and they would find among us 
as believers, find among the exiles those who are capable and willing to leverage their gifts for the glory of God and for the good of others. You see this? Christians, you see, should be the first ones who who are doing good for the sake of others. Christians should, should lead the way. We should be known as people who lead the way to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before our God. We, we should be known for this. We, it, they, the world should be surprised. We're finding Christians who are in this space, Christians who are doing this. Now, Arioch, look at this. He, he's quick to claim credit. He says, I found Daniel. He didn't find Daniel. Daniel found him. Daniel stepped in. But in contrast, Daniel is just as eager to bring credit to God and not to himself. Self-promotion has no place in the kingdom. And in verse 26, he says, are you able? And Daniel answered, verse 27, no one is able. Verse 28, but there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your mind. See, Daniel uses this as an opportunity, again, to bring glory to God. You see a pattern here. He's given credit to God. Daniel shows true humility, while despite you know, his gifting, he remains dependent on God. We can do the same. Jesus did the same. Jesus, he gave up his rights and entered into true humility by suffering, acknowledging that the Father's plan of suffering is better than the way of the world's the world's way of comfort. And we do the same. When we die to ourselves and suffer for the sake of others, always dependent upon God through it all. So listen, you are gifted for the glory of God. You're gifted for the good of others. And then finally, you are gifted for the gospel to be proclaimed. Daniel's prophecy is amazing. And we're not gonna dive into all the details of it here, but it's clear that he's not gonna live to see it nor anyone else who's there standing in his presence. He has a vision of a statue and it represents the kingdom of this world. In verse 34, as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. I'll explain that in a minute. And it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay. Those are symbols of power and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and gold all together were broken into pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You're like, what in the world is he talking about? So there's this worldly power that's completely destroyed by God. Verse 36, that's the dream. Now here's the interpretation. Verse 37, he says, hey, king, God has placed you in that that place of power. Just like he has any other person in position or power, God is sovereign over the entire world. But here's what happens. Look at verse 39. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. Now hang with me. There's gonna be one kingdom, there's gonna be another kingdom. He talks about a fourth kingdom, four kingdoms. Now, most think this is the the Medo-Persian empire, the Babylonians who then come, then the Greeks, that's Alexander the Great, then the Roman empire. Uh, But but in any case, and there's different interpretations there, what he's saying is there's gonna be chaos in the future and every kingdom that comes, regardless of how you interpret what kingdom is this, which one is it? Is it this? Is it America? Is it no? Whatever, listen, every kingdom is going to fall. Every kingdom will be like chaff. Every kingdom will be destroyed. Every kingdom that sought to bring the hope that only the kingdom of God will bring. Ultimately, the kingdom of God will come and fulfill everything these kingdoms were unable to do. But it won't be another statue. Look, it will not be cut by, made by human hands, but by God. And it will bring about peace and joy and stability for all. Look at verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. 
and it shall stand forever. Look at this. The rock that destroys the statue is none other than the stone that the builders had rejected. It's Jesus Christ himself. And we need to make sure that we hold that tension of, yes, interacting, living in a way as exiles that we're able to help order this world for a better future, but not set our hopes on that. Live in this tension that there's coming one day that every kingdom on this earth will be replaced by the kingdom of heaven. We cannot focus too much on shoring up a statue that's going to fall, nor can we focus on escaping this world and yet live again with our feet firmly planted as exiles in Babylon, trusting in God, fixing our eyes on Jesus, building a better immediate future while not placing all of our hope in that future. This should give us courage. This should set us free in these days of pandemic and and strife and struggle in our world. See, this is what helps us overcome. Look at what happens as we close. Verse 45, 46, King Nebuchadnezzar falls on his face to pay homage to David. And in verse 47, the king answered and said to Daniel, Hey, truly, your God is a God of gods and he's Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. And Daniel, look at this, he stepped in, he stayed in, he proclaimed the good news of the coming kingdom. And we can do the same. Friend, this week, Stay in the battle. Stay in your relationships. Love people that God has placed in your life. Share the gospel, the good news, so they too can worship our great King Jesus. Then the king makes Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon. In verse 49, Daniel requests to the king that his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, serve with him. But Daniel stays in his court, so he's kind of this um, you know, he's, he's, he's like a chief of staff and then the others are serving uh, elsewhere, but he didn't pull out. That's what's important. He didn't say, man, this tyrannical king, this is crazy. I'm out. He stayed in. He went in. He brought his friends in so that they could live in this new normal and make a difference. And we must do the same. We must go. We must stay. We must be a faithful presence. Listen, you are gifted to the glory of God. You are gifted for the good of others. And you are gifted for the gospel to be proclaimed. And friends, we get to do this together. I'll close with this thought. The church doesn't have a response to social injustice. The church is the response to social injustice. The church doesn't have a response, you could say, to the disunity, the division in our nation. The church is the response to the division and disunity in our nation. A divided nation needs a united church. And together we come together, feet firmly planted as exiles in Babylon, to make a difference, to be a faithful presence as we focus our lives on Him. So I'm going to close our time in prayer as we come before Him. And friend, if you don't know the Lord, you're not a part of His kingdom, today's your day. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask that you would speak now to all of our hearts, each of us. Friend, right where you are, just bow your head before him. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, and he's not king, he's not leader of your life, give him your life right now. From your heart, just say, yes, Lord, I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Make me the person you've created me to be. Lord, we give you our lives and we ask that you would use us in this new normal. We'd never be the same as we live as a faithful presence wherever you put us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Hey, if you have received Christ or if you have any questions for us, we'd love to interact with you. We'd love to respond. You can text the word Jesus right there. You can see it there. We would love to respond to you and help you in any way we can. So God bless you as now we worship him with our lives.